as uh, as the new podcast. Um, we're still kind of uh, focusing on names. We're thinking of the counseling corner or the the game counselors. Um, speaking of which, I am John, an actual real life counselor. So if you do need any therapeutic help, please don't call me. Um, <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, hey, don't go see somebody if you need help. <laughs> uh, but what's up, everybody? Uh, it's John here. Um, Kyle, you want to give us an oh, yeah? You always start with an oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There he is. Um, <laughs> so we have Heil, a, uh, a veteran system warrior from uh, GameSpot. Now one of the last, what is it, 10 people on the board? Yeah, I say I say fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> Not very many. Um, the rogue is still locking threads, just all willy nilly. <laughs> oh boy! Oh, sweet <laughs> we would gain a member this week. Yes. Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> I'll, uh So, why don't you, as we're doing introductions in this new podcast, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Give us your your bio. My bio. Yeah. What are your likes? What are your dislikes? Do you like long walks on the beach? Do you like DJing for weddings. Are you We're a, a great <laughs> start? <here. laughs> Die, dying boards and beach walks. <laughs> hey guys, yeah, I'm in I'm in the Midwest, so we're uh, like minus twenty four right now. It looks like so with, with, with wind chill, so it's uh brutally cold. Gonna be like that for another week. I grew up here, just stayed around in this area. I do DJ weddings on the side for fun. I enjoy hiking, outdoors, fishing, going to the gym once in a while. I like Walking shucking corn, too. <laughs> and shucking corn. What about yeah. your gaming preferences, Hal? I, I grew up uh, with uh, the PlayStation 1 for, me, for really my first console. I had the Sega Genesis before that. Um, the PlayStation 1 really opened up, uh, I guess, the Pandora's box where I really got hooked into it. So kind of stayed with the Sony <laughs> the Sony thing for um, a lifetime here. But uh, so I enjoy pretty much all really games. Role-playing games, probably my favorite. I do like the third person, like, um, I know Jeff hates them, but um, uh, Uncharted, uh, Tomb Raider type games, I really I really do enjoy those. I have a fun time playing them because they're just uh, interesting to me. Um, but yeah, I think that's about it. All right, all right. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, and now you are, uh, as I've known you a long time, and this is a new podcast, but anyways, we know you as a corporate mouthpiece for Sony now as well. Unpaid. I know. I'm, Un I'm, unpaid, but. <laughs> I'm getting better. I, uh, I, I, uh, I've been nodding my Microsoft here and there, just seeing if anybody notices, but, uh, <laughs> I voted, uh, the Microsoft, uh, Elite controller as my favorite controller. Ooh, wow. I didn't see the that. The modifications it has and the weight uh, is fantastic. It's like the best controller I've ever used, period, for video games. Mm. I'm not, not withstanding keyboard and mouse for computer, but um, it's fantastic. Does it it's ever expensive, but fantastic. Does it have a good weight ratio like the shake weight, you know? <laughs> Cheers, Jeff! I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about that, but it does have some uh, girth to it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> As a removable, uh, you can swap out the thumbsticks, the, the triggers, you get their sensitivity, then their settings inside the app. It's really, I, mean, I don't go all in that, but it's just a great controller. Anyway, yay, Microsoft. Well, it's a pleasure <laughs> wow. pleasure to meet you, Heil, again, for the first time. Uh, we have the man who officiated my wedding and ran a 10K today. Uh, how do you want to be addressed? I'll just be Jeff. Jeff, just Jeff? Yeah, all right, that's fine. All right. Yeah, so tell us, tell us, a, well, I already gave I, a little I, bit, but tell us a little bit about yourself, gaming preferences. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I kind of echo a little bit of Heil with the, uh, with the hiking and outdoors. I'm an avid, uh, outdoors, love it, hiking mountains, climbing all over the, the world, really, I've been, uh, so, but a little bit about my gaming preferences is like, you know, man, I'm like old school, retro SNES games, NES games are like my happy place in the world and uh but more recently i have been uh more of a steam deck gamer um i find that there that's pretty much a hundred percent of my time playing my steam deck working through backlog uh 
yeah, just kind of rooting for the the game industry to to have like a big shift and and break some exclusives down and and get and get every game in every gamer's hands. That's kind of what I've I've been a crusader for lately. Nice, nice. Um, real quick sidebar. Um, you mentioned climbing mountains. Now I like hiking as well. Maybe not as yeah. avid a climber as you, but um, to everyone here um, listening, you know, Jeff Jeff lives um, in uh, Taxachusetts, and um, I was like, let's go. Cl-. I was like, let's go climbing near a mountain. I was like, there's a mountain nearby. I was like, let's go climbing. I think it's like six miles or eight miles all around. He goes, uh, he goes, uh, what is it? He goes, how uh, how vertical is it? I go, it's a ridge, not a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> you were probably like that's fucking lame no not at all man i i think a lot of people have the misconception that like mountain climbing is just hanging and dangling off of rocks and i think that it's more of a like progressively uphill thing like a lot of times you see something in the distance that looks like a wall too and then you hike up to it and you're on it and you realize that you have like plenty of footing and so I I don't know I think it's a little bit overblown but that could just be person to person too you know I wouldn't I wouldn't tell you to go up and get yourself stuck on the side of a rock wall if uh, that makes you uncomfortable because but... because I'm too fat but you you're like Stallone from Cliffhanger not if you keep chucking axes you won't be oh, fat my, not any not not in six months uh, <laughs> well Jeff Jeff thank you very much um, yeah. we'll go down the list here M T Zever uh, that is your kind of internet handle. Uh, but how would you like to be addressed? Zev, Zever, MT? Oh, I have, I am entirely flexible. I, I don't really care either, anyway. Um, the, the whole thing just started off with, with a joke. Uh, MT being a, a shorthand of empty. Empty, um, yeah. Which was uh, a, a meme um, edit about uh, how my sports teams were making me feel inside. Oh. <laughs> um, and still are making me feel inside. Um, so, MT is fine. Paul is fine. Um, uh, that's, you know, I, I, I don't have any strong preference in, when it comes to, like, internet I, usernames. I think, just for the sake of it, as we're using our names, I'm just going to stick with Paul. Fair enough. P, P Money. P Diddy. Paul, Paul, Paul Diddy. Maybe, wow, maybe, 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 maybe not that one. <laughs> yeah, he started with Paul and immediately jumped off the train. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Paul, just tell us, tell us some of your likes, dislikes, things like that. Um, games. What do you enjoy doing? Let us, let us into your world a little bit. Uh, well, like you said at the start, um, so I am a, uh, writer, um, for VG Charts, uh, mm-hmm. which is a gaming sales slash journalism website. Um, I enjoy, uh, video games just as a general medium. Um, also, uh, just have fun writing, um, sort of trying to, to put into words what makes my opinion, my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as like game genres that I like, I think, uh, what I tend to really prefer in games is, uh, titles that, uh, really try and focus on doing a couple of things really well, um, rather than games that try to sort of spread themselves out and accomplish a lot of things, uh, without as much focus, um, uh, love uh action titles um more exploration heavy uh metroidvania s games um dislikes uh at least when it comes to gaming i think a lot of it again sort of falls in that games that you know try to spread themselves out very thin maybe don't have a, a core gameplay mechanic try to to prop things up uh with sort of an air of you know creating an experience um i don't think of myself as a very experiential player um i'm usually in this to try and have some kind of mechanic to to master or or you know gameplay to to get sucked into there are exceptions but i think that that sort of generally defines me um and uh then hobbies um writing reviews that sometimes get me death threats uh oh my god (laughs) if 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 I go a, a full year without either a, a death threat in my inbox or someone insulting my mom, 
uh, something else popping up from an aggrieved fan who didn't like a review I wrote for their game, then I, I've been too lenient. I uh, haven't done my job well enough. <laughs> it makes me, wow. Jeff, it makes me think of, what what was it, Tom McShay? Oh, yes. We, we would just make fun of him all the time. Yeah. yeah. So what what is that? Wow. I, I Is it okay if I ask questions about the death threat emails since, yeah. since yeah. brought it up? So when those come in, are you, is it a sense of dread or is it a sense of like, like this can't be happening? Is it surreal? Like what, what is that like when that happens? So, uh, pretty much everything gets sent through the like website messaging system. Um, cause they can find what, uh, like the, the username that's associated with the, the person who wrote the review. Um, and the first time, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll admit I was a little freaked out. Um, that was for, I think, uh, the definitive edition of Xenoblade 1. And uh, oh, I, had, I had written a review that I didn't even think was that harsh. That was one of the ones that I was surprised to, to, to see. Um, I, I thought it was a, a good like definitive edition but not a great one because it didn't make as many quality of life features that i would have liked um but i guess that's that's kind of besides the point anyway the the first time it happened uh i was you know kind of in in shock um uh there were a lot of like very vivid descriptions of you know what this person would do to like my mother and jesus etc um nowadays when whenever it happens and thankfully it hasn't happened in a while but uh when it does happen i just kind of laugh at it because it's funny i mean it's it's funny in like a a very sick and twisted way i guess but it's it's a you know you're you are this upset over you know the opinion of one person on the internet towards a video game and it's 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 always interesting to me like the the degree to which we get attached to how other people perceive video games right because we would mm-hmm. we would never do that for like another product like i can't imagine anyone you know writing a hate mail because you know i didn't like i don't know the whopper jr or, <laughs> or something like that right? it's it's video games as as a product that we're just so weirdly defensive of mm-hmm. um so anyway that's my story um it's not like you i I wonder how that that i wonder why that is i'm I'm trying to like build the plan as i fly it i like why do people act like to i don't know that's crazy um so yeah it's 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 weird and it's not something that i can like just claim to be innocent of either because i will freely admit there's been times where someone has you know said something very critical about a game i'm like and i i'm like wait a minute that's not fair you know that yeah. and i've i've never like wished you know death upon them or anything <laughs> i mean i've never gotten to the point where i would seriously consider writing them a, a fan mail or or you know something like that telling them that you know uh i hope bad things happen to their mom but like i've i've read criticisms of a game and been like much more annoyed by them than I mm-hmm. would be for, you know, yeah. like the dishwasher in my kitchen or, yeah. or something like that. If, yeah. if someone decided to critique that. So, uh, as best I can figure, I think there's an increased attachment to yeah. something that is sort of like an individualized work of art. Um, it speaks and, to them on an emotional level a little bit. Yeah. 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 So like what what you what type of, of video games, you know, you like says something, I think, about right. you as a person. It's an identifier of who you are. If somebody exactly. shits, on, shits on the game that you love, they're shitting on you. Yeah. Yeah. Um and I, I think it's it it almost becomes, you know, sort of a reflection of, of your personal self in, in the same way that like uh you know, a sports team or, or even like politics does. Right. Um, and, you know, people get very defensive about it. And that's why, you know, taken to its extreme, it's why, you know, whenever something like the Game Award nominees comes out or, or whatever, and, you know, either 
Spider-Man 2 doesn't win any nominations or, you know, no Xbox games get nominated for Game of the Year or what have you. Um, it's it's immediately people, you know, society collapses in on itself on Twitter and it's just been <laughs> fighting for like a month straight. You know what's really strange? It's always your mom, right? Like if somebody's like, I'm going to kill you oh, yeah. and then I'm going to do something to your mom too. It's never your dad. Is that, <laughs> <What>? dad... <laughs> But, Maybe but, I can't take your dad, but I can take your mom. Could you take Mykonos? Well, that's, 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 <laughs> Mykonos is fucking... Mykonos is rock-solid Greek concrete. Yeah, he is. And that's my dad, by the way. We're joking about Jeff could not take him. But I, 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 and, <laughs> yeah. I, and I'm going to... Real quick, Zever, I'm going to just... Or Paul, I'm going to put in one last piece, and then I'll uh, let you continue before we get to Willie. But it's just like... I see the video game poster behind me, right? Metal Gear Solid. And it's like the 18 or 19-year-old who gets attached to Solid Snake is this like really sanctimonious character with his convictions close to his chest and he's only 18 and working at Burger King on Friday nights. And he's just like, you gave Metal Gear Solid a bad review, I'm going to kill you. Because I, <laughs> I, I I relate to Solid Snake. And meanwhile, his mom's like, Jimmy, you got to go to work. And he's like, fuck this guy. Um, but that's besides the point. He's like, Colonel, yeah. well, there's he, someone in the Burger King <laughs> threatening to kill me. Colonel, there's someone. What do I do? <laughs> well, well, you... It's funny because I'm playing through Xenoblade right now, and he mentioned it, and I'm just like, I'm like, I I like anime, but anime fans get fucking obsessed. We had a Labor Day barbecue here in 2022 at my house, and uh, literally some friends of mine sat down for an hour talking about fucking power levels from Dragon Ball Z for like an hour. And I was like, what the fuck? I was like, would you guys just fucking stop? Jesus. Yeah, I have I have never been able to get into the, like, uh, I guess, discussions about, like, character power levels and stuff. Oh, my God. Um, but to each of their own. Anyways, um, one, of the, one of the last people we're going to introduce here is uh, Willie. Willie, how are you? You've been a little mum. Hey there. Hello. It's so good to hear your voice. I know this is only like the third time I've heard it, but it's so good to finally hear you after all these years of working yeah. with you. <laughs> yeah, happy to do so. Um, My name is Willie. I am an independent animator. I'm also a YouTuber. But before all of that, I also used to post on System Wars, just like everyone else here. Um, I play Nintendo games and PC games. Yeah, Willie's a resident uh, Nintendo boy. Um, the proper term is a sheep. A sheep. Yeah. <laughs> Do that again, Jeff. What was that? Ma. All right, that was pretty. Is that a sheep? That was pretty that good. Was pretty so, that was pretty good. That's so good, Jeff. That's so good. You could write that Xenoblade death trade all on your own. Yeah, you could. <laughs> oh my god. Um, as I said earlier, uh, I'm John. Um. I, um, PC, I, I really just love video games. Um, I'll never forget. This is gonna, this is so fucking cliche, but Christmas morning, 1991, I'm four years old. My, I rip open the Nintendo with Super Mario and I'm sitting there playing with my dad Christmas morning. And, uh, ever since then, I was just fucking hooked. Like, and, um, originally posting on GameSpot, I was a cow. But um, or a Still Sony are. or a Sony fan, yeah, go, fuck, are. go fuck yourself, Steam Deck boy. <laughs> <You are. laughs> but um, I just I I really love video games, and um, in in like a little bit of inspiration I got from the internet. I uh, ever since last year, I'm trying to uh, play 24 new games that I've never completed each year, or play the amount of games in the year of the year. So wait, let me rephrase that. That's really bad. Trying to play the amount of games of the year it is. So, trying to accomplish 24 new video games in the year 2024. Um, last year, I tried to do 23. I made it to 18. Um, Jeff, as you know, I had a very big test to take. That was more of the focus. But um, I accomplished 18 new games last year. That's good. Yeah. So. Um, what was the best of the 18 that you played last year? Oh. Um. God, I wish because it might it might not be a new release, right? Because you didn't just play. New no, releases. no. So it's it's not always a new release. It is. Oops, sorry. I'm moving the window around here a little bit. I'm trying to let me pull it up real quick. I know I have the uh, 
the photo here. Um, I think one of the... Have... What was that? I was going to say, where, how do you guys play that many games? I mean, I, I work till like 5, get home at 5.30, eat something. <laughs> I mean, I have like two hours a night at the most. That's if I don't want to watch, you know, any sports, any movies. I don't I see at the speed. I, I game in the morning. I game in the morning. I wake up at like 5 a.m. every day and I either I swim on a local swim team. So I either go to my swim practice or I have a cup of coffee, sit on the couch and play for a couple hours before work. Sometimes You're, I play on the weekends, I've, too. Well, I made a mistake of playing um, Ghost of Toshiba and uh, oh God. AC Valhalla. Both of those were oh. 80 plus hours. Yeah, and some, you, so, dude, some games, some games like will grab extra time from you. Like Elden Ring stole hundreds of hours of game time from you, but like the next game I played didn't grab me as much. So it was like, all right, I went through it 15 hours. It's done on to the next game, eight, 10 hours. It's done on to the next game. But like certain games will, will find a way to uh, definitely grab more of your time. Yo, Elden, Elden Ring was one of those games for me. Um, oh, that game! I, I platinum that game. That game kicked fucking ass. But um, Zever, there was something I wanted to tell you real quick. Like speaking of this list, and we're talking about games and things like that, um, is like I think half the chat has not played Super Metroid here. Um, Zever introduced me to the Metro. He kind of put a gun to my head, and he was like, "Yo, you gotta play this shit. I'm gonna <laughs> kill you." But um, I I never <laughs> threatened death. Um. <laughs> But um, yeah, it's, it's the only way he listens. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, Jeff kind of had to. He was like, "Get up on that altar." He's like, "You're gonna go through with this." Um. <laughs> but um, no, it's oh, here we go. Um, the best game, the best game I played in the twenty three and twenty three. I would say probably um Moonrider. Wow. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of that game. Uh, Moon Rider was a game that came out in 2022. Uh, it is a Mega Man style game, um, kind of without the shooting. It's more like hack and slash. Uh, beat him up a little bit, but it is a side scroller. Um, you have eight levels and a ninth final level with the boss. And it's like very 80s. You're this robo samurai who just fights fucking other robot samurai and crazy bosses. Is um, it called Vengeful Guardian Moon Rider? That's it, yep. Huh, I've never even heard of it. Fucking amazing. Cool. I'm in. Probably like three hours, but yeah. So, but um, yeah, that's, that's uh, podcast over. Um, we've introduced everybody. We made it 17 or 23 <laughs> minutes and we're done. Um, but, um, let's just ask a general question. Like, what's everyone playing right now? Start with Todd. I'm, I'm wondering what Todd's I'm, playing right now. I'm playing Sea of Stars. That game roped me in. I thought I would just try it. And it's just, it's fantastic. The mechanics are great. The combat's fun. They have, uh, what are they called? Amulets? Um... Which is kind of a unique twist because once you collect these amulets, you can go into your settings and turn them on or off. Some of them will make the game harder. Some of them will make it easier, um, which I thought that was just a cool twist. Um, the combos are really fun. Um, it's a typical, like, you know, old school Final Fantasy type game like that, but um, there's no dialogue. Um, little cutscenes there are. Um, I mean, they have, like... Uh, Text, sorry. They don't speak. There's no voice acting. It's just uh just words. Um but anyway, I hope so I'm playing that now. <laughs> playing that <laughs> in uh Halo Infinite. Um playing that heroic uh campaign with my friend, trying to get through that. And then my daughter, uh which I know it's been around for a while, but she plays For Honor. Uh oh. so I played that with him last night and just got wrecked. <laughs> So I'm not I'm not I'm not ready for that yet. Don't have the skill set, but uh, fucking that was annihilated. So yeah, those three. It's just not even it's not even close. I can't block. I can't do anything. You just die, die, die. <laughs> it's like Call of Duty except with swords. So, um, but yeah, that's why I'm playing those three. 
That's pretty cool. I've been playing a lot of the similar games. For example, I've been playing Sea of Stars as well. I wouldn't call it like a Final Fantasy. It's more like Chrono Trigger. Oh, and fuck yeah. It is a really, really well-made game. Um, there is a lot of dialogue in that game. It's not voice acted, you're right, but there is a lot of dialogue. It's very text-heavy, yeah, but the story is. is pretty good. The characters are really good. The writing is pretty clever. And the main thing about it are its visuals, its graphics. The music is really good, too, made by the composer of Front Trigger, but the visuals themselves are really utterly fantastic. The pixel art, the animation, the clever ways to use modern effects with like 2D pixel art, st- art style makes the game look really, really special and a joy to watch. Plus, it's actually a really good RPG. Like, I was playing Starfield, and as soon as I started playing Sea of Stars, I was reminded, oh, this is what a good RPG is like. So I deleted Starfield and just kept playing Sea of Stars. It's really, really good. (laughs) I've also been playing Halo Infinite for sure. Hey, uh, uh, can can we get... get, can we get into Starfield for a second? Stanfield? <laughs> oh, God, you want to get into Starfield? We're, we're going on our first tangent already, huh? <laughs> oh, no. Two, two minutes, two minutes. The fact that... Well, first of all, I'm, I'm building a new computer. But the fact that I needed a fucking SSD for Starfield to work properly, by the time I played the fucking game, all wind was out of my sails. You just fuck, don't care. Fuck that the, game. The, I don't but, want to look at dead has, people in the eyes. Yeah. But Bethesda's been a, a disaster for first time. Like, I I genuinely did not understand how people were getting excited for that game leading up to it. Um, and I, I, I don't want to, like, come at this from, you know, an approach of, uh, you know, I don't think you guys should enjoy things stop having fun no get more death threats but, please but, <laughs> but like i'm proposing one right now it, like bethesda has has clearly been like holding everything together with its creation engine with like dicks and masking tape for a couple decades like like the creation engine was barely holding itself together when Fallout New Vegas came out, and that was like what 2009, oh. 2010, and and now we're being told that like that same engine is gonna make a a massive you know space adventure, uh, with relatively ish modern graphics, and you know like a thousand procedurally generated planets or whatever the fuck else was in there like there was zero chance this was gonna hold up no way at all i i don't i don't understand how how this was was ever considered to be something worth getting excited for i don't think i agree with that starfield on its own like if you look at starfield as its own product it's pretty good it delivers exactly on what it said it was gonna do the problem is is it is not 2016 anymore. Like, we've had other games do the same thing Starfield promised us will do, and they've actually done it for real. Like, what everybody thought when they saw the original trailer for Starfield, what everyone thought when they heard Todd Howard say those things explaining what the game is, they thought it was a next generation RPG that took place amongst the stars. Just like a next generation version of what they have done before. Problem is, for a couple of the same reasons that you said about their engine, which I don't think is actually a big issue. I think an engine can keep refined and be improved. Just look at Nintendo. For decades, Nintendo used the same engines that they use with Mario 64 and Ocarina of Time. Those same engines are the same ones that power Wind Waker and Twilight Princess, like, over a decade later. So I don't think the engine itself is a problem. I think there's other aspects of the developer that may cause those issues to happen. Maybe a lack of confidence, a lack of dedication to their workers. Maybe a lack of morale in the team. Maybe it's just that they said, hey, this is what the game is. It needs to be out by this time. Make it happen by this time. Just not a lot of confidence in their own developers. Because Starfield did deliver what it said it was going to do problem is it delivered it by the standards of games 
way past in 2016. Like if you look at Starfield as a game that came out in 2016, before No Man's Sky, before Star Citizen, before Elite Dangerous, it's an amazing game. And unlike past Bethesda titles, it's actually pretty well made. Like, yeah, when I played it, I saw two or three glitches, but it wasn't unplayable. It was actually pretty well put together as far as Bethesda games go. It's just not very good compared to basically anything else we can play right now. The standards have changed, and Bethesda hasn't really grown up with the game industry. So I push back against a couple of those things. Um, I think the first thing I'd say is there there is no inherent problem with reusing an engine, um, but I don't think the Zelda example works because Nintendo consistently reused the Zelda engine and the Mario engine when they were already working well. Like the creation engine was already struggling massively when New Vegas came out. I mean, that one of the reasons that game's Metacritic is as low as it is is because half their viewers like could barely get through the game without it crashing every 15 or so minutes. Yo, I, I mean, was, that game, I was a day one gamer on that and it was completely broken. Yeah, it, was, it was a disaster. Like you, it, even today, it's still a struggle to, to get through that game without, you know, getting mods to, to help with stability there. Um, and while that doesn't necessarily equate to an issue, if, you know, you can patch the engine and, and stabilize it, I do think you can still see evidence in the game of how it's limited by what the the engine is ultimately capable of. Um, things like loading screens, uh, the need for consistent fast travel that breaks immersion, uh, a lot of the ways that uh, either NPCs don't still don't still struggle to emote properly, um, dubious hitboxes on weapons. A lot of those things are factors because of the engine that's still in place, or at least the slightly upgraded version. It's Creation Engine 2 now. I have to officially refer to it as such. So I, I do think it's it's held back by the the material it's, it's running off of, and I think you're still going to see Bethesda games continue to review poorly until they move away from that. And, and to, like, kind of... Jeff, you had something to say real quick, right? Well, I guess I was going to say, as somebody who, um, you know, has not played Starfield yet, you know, I, I specifically put distance between the launch of like a game like Cyberpunk and when Cyberpunk was truly finished a year later. Uh, is there hope for people like me who, uh, and I'm not suggesting that Starfield is a bad game, it's Metacritic rating is mid 80s, like there are plenty of people, Willie on this podcast is a, a testament to people who enjoyed the game. But is there hope for someone like me who's likely going to come at the game a year later uh, that the game will be something more grand the way that Cyberpunk is? Uh, or is Starfield what it is? And that's it. So I'm, I'm going to say this here is that uh, you need to play Death Stranding in order to understand Starfield. So until, <laughs> until you play Death Stranding, oh, no, no. But it also, you're gonna make me walk, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> what? He he hasn't played Death Stranding yet. I always tease him about it, but no, like the difference is, is that games like Skyrim and Starfield are fixed by their communities. Cyberpunk was like CD Projekt Red, like, and and I'm gonna move the conversation along in a second. CD Projekt Red was like, well, we fucked up really badly, and we're going to fix this. And they took the time to essentially re-release a whole new game. The game, Cyberpunk 2.0, is completely different from the first iteration. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, outside the story structure, side quests, and all, like, the street-level shit you do is the same, but, like, crafting system, the way guns work, the way your leveling system, the way you build your character, like, it's all different now. Like, it's a completely for, new game. For me, there was never a 1.0, because I just avoided the game until I, did I too, was yeah. ready, ready to play it. Um, and I, I did look at screenshots of the way it used to look and stuff like that. But, you know, it'd be nice to know. I know that uh, Bethesda has announced that I think with every six to eight weeks intervals, they're planning on doing content drops or not content drops, but like patches and fixes and content adjustments i i don't know what what they're gonna do but 
they're they're still paying attention to their product. And and that brings me into video games in 2024, right? In a month, in s- five weeks, Final Fantasy fucking Rebirth is redropping. And guess what? That's going to be the whole fucking package. And they're not going to have to fix a goddamn thing about it. I, when I say fix, I mean like big structurally. You know what I mean? So, like, I move us along into, like, 2024 and our anticipated games and what we're looking forward to. And, like, games, and I feel like CD Projekt Red, or actually, no, No Man's Sky started this, where it's like, yeah, we have to fix it. So, developers saw this choice to say, hey, we'll release the game fucking half-assed and we'll fix it along the way. And And while I don't like that, um, as a consumer, it it like irritates me and infuriates me at time. Um, no Man's Sky is a goddamn masterpiece. So like like the time taken is was was good. It's same with same with Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk is a blast to play. Um, but mm-hmm. but No Man's Sky specifically, and if you want to tie it in with Starfield, like my hope for Starfield, I think that. Uh, Paul had said, you know, in the beginning, like, what were we all hoping for? Like, I was hoping for uh, something that that evolved the, the 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 feeling of expansive space exploration, the way that uh, No Man's Sky did, and to a lesser degree, the way that the original, like, say, Mass Effect game made me feel, where I was a, a space explorer and I could land on a planet and I could explore, and there was a bunker over here. I was thinking like story rich. Uh, you know, and you could uh, flip the Mako over. <laughs> try to flip the Mako over. I right? can't be done. I did um, it. I showed you. Yeah, I know. I still don't believe it. Yo, go fuck yourself. Photoshop is real, John. That is not. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> no, but I, like, like when I first played Mass Effect, that game gave me a boner. Like it gave yeah, me like the hopes of like what video games can be. Yes, and I, I there's so many games that I've wanted to revisit that feeling, and I'll be the first to tell you that they didn't get it right, right? Like, you still landed on an empty planet, and you th- fought a Thresher Maw, and then you took out, like, a vanilla, samey little outpost that had a little tiny sliver. Sometimes it was just audio log content, but it was enough, and it gave you that, like, idea, like, to John, to your point, that the future of games was going to be, like a universe of planets that we were going to land on and have actual story content and things that made it special and, and connected. And I think that to some degree, I, you know, I'm an old dog. I've been playing video games since the Atari 2600. So like, Jesus like Christ. for me, I don't, I don't like over, I don't like over analyze the game industry anymore and get like overly hyped for games. Uh, but I, I was hoping that Starfield was going to deliver on that promise, a, an evolved mass effect one. Yeah. God, Howard can, Scott Howard can, uh, yeah. What? Go say it. No. Sixteen times the detail, John. What? Sixteen times the detail. You <sighs> <laughs> need people just. One of the things that I've learned that people just need to shut their fucking mouth sometimes. <laughs> like, just be like, "Yo, we're making this game. You can go to planets." Don't overhype it yourself as like this kind of like I'm. Todd Howard and the memes and the just fucking shut up and make your game. He got drunk. He got drunk on his own product. And what he should have done is he should have had the same approach that he did for uh, Fallout 4, where he took the stage, he showed a finished product of the, how the game was going to work, and bam, four months from today, this game is going to be out. And it was great. It was. It was. It was. It's, I still to this day say it was the best announcement for a game. Whether you like the game or not, that's the announcement I want for every video game. You don't need to tell me about it a year, even two years, three years in advance. Don't tell me about it. Just tell me when you're ready to talk about it. And then talk about it. I'm a big boy. I can handle that. Again, like 2024, Square was like, all right, we'll drop a trailer in 20, late 2022. Uh, we won't give a release date. And then... Uh, Come June, we'll give a 2024 release date, and that's it. They shoot themselves in the in the foot by doing doing that stuff. But you know, I'm not a bean counter for them. I'm not in their financials. I I don't know how they're trying to impact their stock prices and 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 how they want to impact like buzz and hype and get people talking about their product, right? Because that's what we do. Um, I, I, I just yeah. I want I want to say something. Heil, jump in on this shit. You're so like, are you? 
Nope, I'm, just, I'm still going to do that. I want to. Are, are you still murdering oh, somebody? Oh. Are you cutting right, up the body? Gonna, like... gonna edit, edit that bit out of the podcast. <laughs> um, no, I did. I did want to say, and this this might actually lead us back on topic of the question of games being played. Um, I think uh, the new Prince of Persia game mm. is pretty much the perfect example of like how to advertise your game in a way that both shows it off and isn't misleading. Um, like. I will freely admit when I heard that announcement and saw that it wasn't uh, the Sands of Time remake, I was exceptionally skeptical. And then they just showed off like it was like a minute and a half trailer of just pure gameplay. And it looked like it kicked ass. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, well, I'm fully on board with it. And now the game comes out in less than a week and the reviews are in and everyone's saying it kicks ass and it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sold. I'm, I'm, I'm in on this. And like, what it did was it, it basically allowed me to, to just, you know, I'm creating my own expectations for this based off what I've seen, rather than the developer or the publisher or whoever manufacturing expectations that the product can't actually live up to. And it's a lot harder to like manufacture those fake expectations right. with real gameplay than it is for you know some hype man to be on stage and you know just say hey this is you're going to be able to explore like never before and you know stack more baked potatoes than you ever thought possible in the corner of your ship or whatever (laughs) i'm sorry i'll get off starfield's case now (laughs) yeah yeah, yeah. (laughs) it's a gift that keeps giving I'll, i'll i'll move on to making fun of like the new god of war games or something something <laughs> something that i'm sure will go over much more smoothly <laughs> did everybody say what they did everybody get a chance to say what they're currently playing we didn't even start <laughs> I, I, I was gonna say that like today is a bit we I, got I, like I, two people, into yeah. it, like, yeah, two people into it. I'll, I'll say that my um my uh land this today's kind of a landmark day for me because i completed the legend of zelda the wind waker for the first time this morning Oh, nice. Oh, my yeah. God. The first, first time in my time? life. Yes, I played the HD version, and I woke up this morning. I had been... Um, uh, you're welcome. I, I, had, I thank you. I had hit, <laughs> I had hit, a, stumbling, I had hit a stumbling block um, uh, uh, at the Triforce quest. Which oh, my God. I, I, you know, I don't think... I think that that's yeah, pretty that's, well established. That's a drag. <laughs> yeah, it's... You know what it is? I think that, like, you finally get everything, and you have all your toys, and your and. Now you're on this, like, I've got to go back across the sea. And, uh, I, well, I don't need to explain it to you guys. I think you, you probably get it. But um, I was able to get through it. No big deal. Um, game they made that it's, shit, a to, it's a total master. They made it's, that shit it's, faster, too. Yeah. Like, cause oh, you, yeah. You collect, I, you collect, like, six six pieces that make up or eight. It was, like, it's fucking wild you know, you in the original. What? Yeah, they they let you skip over a lot of the uh, map shards. Yeah, you can that's it. The the pieces now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, there were. It was a little um tricky with. I had to get Triforce maps, and then I had to find where the maps like lead to. It was. A, and... Yeah, it was a little tricky, but I, I'm not complaining. The game was incredible and um had a great. I love the combat system and. Uh, as someone who played Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom before playing Wind Waker, um, I can see a lot of inspiration from from Wind Waker in those two games. And uh, I I don't can't put my fingers specifically on things. Maybe just characters. Like, is that the first time you see the Korok seeds? Is is in, or do you see the Korok seeds earlier? Do you see them in like Ocarina of Time? Mm-mm, no. Uh, no, I think the Koroks are, yeah, Wind Breath Waker. Of the, Wind Waker. The Wind Waker. Koroks and the Rito are... Yes, the Ritos. W- Wind, Wind Waker. Waker. Yeah. All Wind Waker. And so there, there were things, and in, in, in even the gameplay, I, I felt like, was this really polished, you know, evolution from that that era, and uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was fantastic. Paul, I told him he has to do a Ganon run next. <laughs> you need to do one at some I, point. I know I have to do my yearly. Uh, Jeff, I do a yearly no death run of Wind Waker. Mm. And and difficulty turned up to 
Well, I've been I've been trying to get him to do it for Twilight Princess because there's a um, a feature in the HD version of Twilight Princess where if you like tap the Ganon amiibo, it uh, like makes all enemies do like four times damage and you can't get any hearts. So Ooh. it's just like a super crazy difficulty yeah. spike. Um, but he keeps ducking that one. I have to do that. I will. I will fulfill that promise this year. No, you won't. You always yes, say that, and then you I know. will. <laughs> I will fulfill that promise this year. I try. I tried yeah. to. I tried to do Ganon mode in uh, in Wind Waker. I fucking ate shit at the fortress. All right, I'm. I'm holding you to that. And if well, you we have do proof not, now. If you do not do. If you do not do a a Ganon Twilight Princess run by the end of the year. You have to stream one of these podcast episodes from a Waffle House. Yes, I have to. He's got them too, have, where he lives. I don't have Waffle House. We don't. Have what do Waffle you got? House. Diners everywhere. You got those those Jersey no, we're, diners. We're, those no, Long we're, Island t- diners. we're talking about the actual Waffle House chain. Oh, okay. Right. Like where the best fighters go to. Yeah, I really just want to see John get into a Waffle House. <laughs> All right, I'll I'll accept like an IHOP or a Denny's. You got to have one of those. But we do have IHOP and Denny's. Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. There you go. Yeah. That's that's basically just you know, like mid mid midweight Waffle House. Like that's where the 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 grade B fighters go. <laughs> uh... Yeah, I don't. I I maybe I'll do uh, Twilight Princess next. I haven't done that one either. So I've been like all backlog. I think I'll send I you my like, copy. Like twelve, maybe thirteen. I I'm just trying to like pick away from the backlog. That's been my focus lately. That's the whole point of like the twenty four and twenty four. Yeah, yeah. So who didn't? Uh, who else didn't get to say what they're playing right now? Uh, Willie, Willie. Well, Hyle's playing Sea of Stars. Willie's playing Sea of Stars. <laughs> That's right. What do you um, think about that? Another cool thing about that game, just real quick, uh, they had, I guess, they had a round of uh, supporters to help with the game. So what they did is they made this little island um, that you can go on to, and then they give you a code, but you can go up to it, and your name is put on a shrine. I thought that was a, a neat touch for the people that uh, gave to the game. I don't, I don't think I've ever really seen that uh, hmm. in a game before. I mean, I couldn't see any because I didn't have any codes, but... Um, Googled it and seen what it was all about, so that was that's kind of cool. But it's a fun game; yeah. highly recommend. Yeah. I'm about done. By the way, Heil, I don't know if you knew this. You you probably did, but do you know that you know the game The Messenger, right? That came out before Sea of Stars. It's like the prequel to the Messenger or to Sea of Stars. I don't think so. No, it's a 2D. It's like it's basically like like a, like a per, a, a perfected Ninja Gaiden. I was about to say that's like, like, that's the ninja yes. game, right? Yes, the messenger is the prequel to Sea of Stars, and it is made by the same company. Oh. And so they took oh. their IP and they they had the balls. This is see, this is something you'll never get in AAA gaming. They took their incredible you dude. You played the messenger, John. I know you did because that that game is incredible. I have it. I haven't played it. Oh my god! It. If, has anyone else here played the message? Don't, oh, don't oh my god me. I am going to oh my god you. <laughs> have you played it, Willie? I have not. No, what? So the Dude, messenger half of us a... haven't played fucking Super Metroid. What it makes you think we're going to play the messenger? Uh, you, I you play Super it... Metroid. Yeah, see, Willie has. Willie, you owe it to yourself to play the messenger. I promise you will be like, holy crap. I didn't realize that a 2D action platformer can be this good. It's like when I do the action platformers are some of the greatest games ever made, ever made. And the company had the balls to make the follow up game be a JRPG. (laughs) Like that is where indies give you way more bang for your buck than any AAA studio is ever going to give you. What kind of balls? So, so you you say that that only an indie studio will will do that, but uh, somebody to challenge him. Finally, no, I want yes, no challenge. (laughs) So, 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 uh, this, this sort of ties again also into, to games coming up soon. Um, the Yakuza slash Like a Dragon series, mm-hmm. right? Uh, was a, a street brawler series for like 12 ish years. Um, switched to turn based RPG with, uh, Yakuza 7 in 2020. 
and uh, the eighth game is is coming out at the end of this month. Um, those are absolutely fantastic games, both JRPG slash brawler style, and and worth playing if if you have anything vaguely resembling a sense of humor. You you've told me to play those games, but you've told me they're like eighty hours. You you played uh, zero, didn't you? No, I have zero. Zero was on the twenty three and twenty three list. Okay, I have they're, zero. Too. They're they're not they're not eight. I mean, they're eighty hours if you do like literally all of 100%. the side content. But like the main stories are like twenty twenty five ish hours. Maybe is, which that. one, Paul? Would you recommend to start? Would you recommend zero to start with? Because that's is that the first one chronologically? I would say either zero or seven. Um, zero is the good starting point if you want to play through all of them. Uh, seven is also good if you want to like play eight like because there's there's basically kind of a, a soft reboot with seven mm. um where it brings in a new cast of characters and there's a new main protagonist and it's you know kind of the the direction that the series goes in kind of shifts heavily um so seven is i think a, a good jumping in point as well um since it's you know a genre shift new characters and it it is for the most ish part uh, a fairly self contained story that you can understand without having too much background to it. Mm. Um, so if you just want to, you know, play eight and don't want to go through like, God, how many is it? <laughs> Forty games. Seven, there's like, there's seven, like hundreds there, and hundreds of there, hours. There's right? yeah, there, yeah. There's there's like eight other Yakuza games um yeah. the, that's 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 the, those two are probably fine well i think i think the counter the counter argument is is well received where i think what you're saying is that triple a games do over time take uh, calculated risks to evolve and change the formula uh and i don't want to put words in your mouth so if, I, if you're saying something different definitely um you know let me know but i i uh I do, I do think that in 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 some respect that an indie studio to, to change completely genres like that uh, in one sequel is is pretty is it's at least a pretty neat thing. It's a, it is a risk. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like in indie games, definitely do it far more. Um, yeah. Like uh, the Momodora series, for instance, just oh. had Moonlit Farewell come out this month. Um, like the first game yeah, in that know. is like a just a uh, almost uh, like a cave story esque platformer. Then it goes to like an exploration game, back to a linear platformer, and then to a Metroidvania. And that's like four games, four basically different genres right there. I love that. Um, so so indie games absolutely do it more. Mine mine was just more of a uh, a, a fun note for a AAA yeah. game that had done it. Yeah, so Sea of Stars, I haven't done it yet. I will get to that one soon, but glad that uh, you guys are having fun with that. So, John. <laughs> yes. Can we? Do you want to do? Do you want to do games we're looking forward to in twenty twenty four? Should we talk about Microsoft's shifts of uh, IPs? This podcast. The tangent from Starfield to Yakuza to indie games <laughs> is just been, it's I, thick, we, baby. It's a cake we, we we always come in with an agenda and we always fuck it up and I love it. Yeah, um, okay. I the, love the agenda is just the, the agenda is just like broad strokes. It's like I don't jumping know. off point. Um, I think we should talk about Microsoft. All right. I. You, you know, you brought it to me. You know well, more yeah, about it than I, just, I do. Well, I guess, don't I guess look at so, don't look at me with like the deer in the headlights look. No, I'm no no deer in a headlight. Um, no, I guess I I was curious uh, to other gamers' perspectives on what we're seeing with Microsoft right now, and I think that the the talk, at least from what I see online, uh, based around <clears throat> their willingness to start pushing their games and publishing their games on other platforms. I want to think s- uh, this week we heard that uh, 
they're thinking about putting, or at least to some degree, putting um, Sea of Star, uh, Sea of Thieves on other platforms as well as Hi-Fi Rush. Uh, and uh, there has been a lot of chatter, and I, it maybe it's just all rumor, maybe it's just whatever, but people talking about how they can imagine a day coming where we are playing Halo on a PlayStation. They must have taken that. They must have taken that. Uh... PlayStation 5 outsold the Xbox 3 to 1 really hard. <laughs> um, no, but um, Microsoft, show me your nuts. Show me your balls, Microsoft. Do What it. does that mean, John? Do what does it. that mean? Do it. Take a risk. Do it. Do it. So what do you mean, do it? They were the first ones. They've been doing it for a while. Yeah, Microsoft they, they, has that's been all they do. Games multi platform for a decade at this point. Day one. It's just. It was Sony that just started doing it now. So why aren't people saying, oh, is Sony going to go? Is, is there not going to be any more PlayStations anymore? Microsoft is doing the right thing of continuing yeah. to put their games in multiple platforms as they've already done. And Sony is now copying them, trying to do the same thing because they know more money, more places that your games are on will get means more money. The last person to do it will be Nintendo. I don't well, know if Nintendo will ever mm, do it. No. But it it is been it will be a really cool thing for Nintendo to sell their games in other systems eventually in the future. But for now, at least in the fight that Sony and Microsoft are in, I think they're trading blows pretty well. So, no. correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think it is more serious from Microsoft's standpoint because I think um, uh, what's his name, Phil Spencer. Uh, basically said that if they couldn't get a certain number of Game Pass subscribers, then they would consider exiting the market. And I think that quote was kind of blown out of proportion um, because it's probably a pretty achievable goal. Um, and I don't think it's particularly likely that they miss that target. But it sort of, I think, reinforced the notion that, that Xbox is so far behind Sony and Nintendo as well um, in terms of console sales uh, that it just puts them in a position where, yeah, I mean, you know, if, if a couple things don't go right for them now, like, you know, the money making off a subscription service, then it might be time to, to pack it in entirely for them rather than just, you know, going third party. Wait. It's definitely a remnant of an old narrative that doesn't really exist anymore. It's definitely a narrative that better fits maybe 15 years ago, perhaps 10 years ago, where console sales equals the success of your company, where in reality, that has never been the case. Usually, no. hardware has always been sold at a loss, and money mm -hmm. has been made through software. And Microsoft knows this. Um, that quote about them exiting the market, that is more of a reference to when the new CEO of Microsoft came in. I think his name is Nadella. He did not want to keep the Xbox brand around because it was a money loser, basically. Yeah. And, it, yeah. and it made sense. But because of people like Phil Spencer and the people at Xbox, they were able to convince him to keep the Xbox brand around. And the new plan that they have going on now, I think, is pretty smart because they realize, oh, Console sales don't really matter. What matters is, are they playing your games? For me, I have never owned an Xbox before. But yet, I play games from Microsoft. Microsoft gets my money every month with Game mm -hmm. Pass. I play on Windows because I want to play their games. I play their games on an Xbox Series controller before that, an Xbox 360 controller because they designed their operating system to work well with their controller and they made it a standard so that almost every game released on PC works with an Xbox 360 by default. This is not something that they did recently. This is something that they made happen in 2006 with the Games for Windows Live program. Been because really that, good. Yeah. So I, I have so, the... Sorry, go ahead. So even now, when Sony has to release a game on a different platform, guess what standards they have to use? They have to use the Xbox controller. They have to design their game to work with the Xbox controller. Right now, I'm playing Spider-Man Miles Morales with an Xbox controller. And that's pretty cool. And that's all thanks to Microsoft because they know 
it's not the same war. The war that fanboys are fighting about how many console series are offered, that's a very small battle. Microsoft is thinking about winning the war for real because the way Microsoft sees it, you don't need to have an Xbox hardware to play Xbox games. Just like how you don't need to have a Sony branded DVD player to play DVDs. As long as you put the disc in, that is Microsoft is winning. Obviously, this is the modern era, so we don't actually put this in, but the situation is the same. You're giving Microsoft money. Doesn't matter if you're playing Minecraft on Nintendo Switch or Minecraft on PlayStation or Minecraft on PC. Microsoft is still winning. So, so the idea is that PlayStation is now selling Xbox 3 to 1. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Well, that was a joke, but... I don't think Microsoft really cares, though, because no. that's not the battle they're fighting. So I, I, I do think that they... they I mean, I don't know how much this fully affects their decision-making, but I, I do think it financially impacts them notably, um, because you're, you're absolutely right. Consoles are sold at a loss, but they've always been sold at a loss. And a big part of the reason why companies have been okay with that for years has been because you make a ton of money after the console is sold from things like subscription services, from things like licensing fees, um, from things like publication fees, right? Um, so like to take your example of my Minecraft, uh, when Microsoft sells Minecraft, a copy of Minecraft on Nintendo Switch, they make less money on it than they do if you buy it on PC or on Xbox because they have to pay Nintendo for the privilege of selling it on their platform. And while they probably aren't going to go you know they're not going to leave the business certainly the the discussion i think is is more related on you know what does this mean uh for them specifically selling xboxes and whether it's likely for them to to exit the the console making business for lack of a better way of putting it so and that is something that i think is is very feasible and it's something that's coming up now um and i i have the the quote you know directly ahead of me now from uh September of last year, um, where Phil Spencer says that Xbox would leave the gaming business if Game Pass subscribers base did not increase significantly on PC and cloud by 2027. So it's it's very much a possibility out there. And I, I think, at least personally, even as someone who doesn't play much Xbox, I'd be kind of sad to see it go. Mm-hmm. Because I think that just removes even more of the incentive for other console developers to improve their services, right? It removes even more competition from the picture. Um, you know, that, that sort of like taking, for instance, internet subscriptions, right? There's been kind of a flat $60 fee for uh, PS Plus and Xbox Live Gold. Um, if Xbox, you know, goes out of the way, there's nothing really there to to keep sony from jacking that up to 70 80 100 dollars a year or whatever they decide those is... dickheads already did jack it up to like 80 a year yeah. last year oh did they, am i am i am i that out of touch with it oh my god but uh i mean that 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 incentive is probably already eroding away because of you know how limited the xbox player base is right now to begin with what? um yeah that that what brings was, up uh, console Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you know, and, and I'm, I'm touching off of that, but also on, on Willie's point about console sales financially don't, don't make these companies rich. The software does. The problem with, though, is that the console sales do dictate what the install base is. And so Microsoft yes. not being able to sell consoles means that Microsoft doesn't increase the number of Game Pass. Uh, so they they plateau where Sony uh, is sticking their content uh, to their system, making their system more coveted, meaning people are willing to go out and buy it. And even though the sale of that console is not making Sony rich, it's increasing their install base. To it's increasing the number of people playing on the platform where if Microsoft is not selling Xboxes, uh, then they're only relying on their PC community. 
Nothing. I, I'm. Uh, I have something completely opposite of that point on Game Pass, yeah. so I'm gonna shut my mouth. Well, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was. I was gonna say, the, my We're all friends here, John. Uh, are we? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Um, my only gripe with Game Pass is that they don't put those fucking. They don't put. I, I'm gonna check right now. I don't think, yes, they have the cloud gaming, but they need to put fucking, they need to put their old 360 games on PC already. They just need to fucking do it. I love 360. Like, I can't play Gears 1 or 2 on fucking yeah. game. I can't play it on the PC, but I can absolutely play it on cloud gaming. And that's a pain in the butt, but, uh, and stream gears too. Let me just install it and play it. Um, the other thing I was about to say about Game Pass is, um, it's magnificent. It's really good. I really love Game Pass. That's it. You're such a lemming. <laughs> I even enjoy so. it. I do because the games come out day one. I'm done buying physical copies. I think just because they stack in your where are you going to store them and then they're worth like pennies my, oh my nostalgia uh, that when I last time I turned in my PS4 and 360 games I, I mean I got $12 it was ridiculously yeah like $12 <laughs> if it's like a sports game or something like that because I do like the sports game those are like 25 cents yeah right oh, I'd rather just rent them I know the argument against renting them um, but I'd much rather just pay my money for both Sony and Microsoft to rent my games, play them, and enjoy them. Because I'm, I'm at this point in my uh, gaming life, I'm probably never going to play a game a second time. Mm. So to have it or just have a, a a copy for nostalgia just doesn't hold uh, any weight for me. I don't know about mm. you guys, but nope, no. Nope. I got rid of them too, man. I'm all fuck physical old. shit. Fuck. Physical yeah, I shit. can't. I, I can't. I can't anymore. It's too much. It, like, can I show some, something real quick to you guys? <laughs> it, it, no, it's not like that bad. But like, listen, like this is cool shit. But like, here, here's like some of my shit, like my gaming collection shit. It's just, it's too much shit. I have too much shit. I don't want there's, there's never, there's never enough shit. <laughs> I know. And there's more <laughs> shit in the closet. Like, I'm just like, I have too much shit. I don't want more shit. I want less shit. Nah, always, always collect more shit. I know, and watch. I'm gonna follow that guideline really closely this year. I'm gonna just buy a ton of shit this year that I don't need. Like always, always get more gaming stuff and get more cats. The two things uh, you can never have. The enough. one thing, the one thing, right? Like Jeff, Jeff, I was talking to you about it. Zever, Willie, you know about it. Hyle, you might not know about it, but um, I'm I'm doing some like um, um, it seems tangential, but it's gonna fit in. Uh, I'm doing some uh, construction work here in the basement to shift the room around to make it bigger. And, uh, like, the first thing I told everyone after I passed my test was like, yeah, I'm buying that fucking four-player TMNT one-up arcade. Oh, yeah. Like, what the fuck? I don't need any more shit. And then I'm telling everyone I'm going to buy a four-player yeah, don't arcade. don't buy more shit, man. And I'm buying, a, I'm buying Walden. Everything. I'm going to Go buy read a... read Walden. What, what is that? Henry David Thoreau. Go read the book. You won't <sighs> buy any more shit. <laughs> John's, John's, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna tune in for like the stream in two weeks and john's gonna be out in the middle of the world <laughs> yeah, yeah. transcendentalist, the transcendentalist podcast oh my god no fuck you know what's funny and this is gonna be tangential but i just came away from a 24-hour stint of the woods one of my friends um asked me to be his best man in his wedding which is awesome but um we went up to like bumblefuck new york right um, where anytime I get that close to the woods or there's like only a door between me and nature, I always think that the Blair Witch is going to come get me. Oh, dude, you are such, you're so saturated with media filth. <laughs> Just go enjoy the woods, man. I can enjoy the woods. During the Blair the Witch is going to get yeah, the Blair, me. Yeah, the Blair Witch is going to get me. My wife will tell you the Blair Witch is going to get me. You're good. Which, which friend? Yeah, yeah. Who, until... who are you the best? 
Who are you the best man for? My friend Soul. Oh. Not Sal. No, Sal is definitely not getting married. I'm like, whoa, that happened quick. <laughs> you guess what? It is going to happen quick. It's going to be a yeah. Vegas wedding for him. Yeah. Yeah, so anyways, let's wrap up with our favorite uh, games we're looking forward to in 2024 and then wrap it up because i gotta, I got to bounce in a minute. Look, i got to take care of my Mine's easy. I just have one. It's uh, Rise of Ronin. I love the Japanese uh, art. We talked about that last with uh, Ghost of Toshiba being one of my favorite games, and this one's supposed to be right up there. And it confirmed it's going to have uh, easier difficulty for us noobs, so it's not oh going to be souls, souls crushing. So, um, But I might play it. If, uh, we'll see. If, if I get better at the combat, I might ramp it up. But looking forward to that game. That looks fantastic. That's it. Nice, Team Ninja. Very cool. How about uh, Willie? What are you looking forward to? The next generation Nintendo system and whatever oh. games Nintendo is making for it. That's going to be awesome. I wonder how well that'll run on my PC. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any games in particular, Willie, or just kind of whatever whatever the uh, launch uh, window is for the Switch 2, if the Switch 2 is in fact a 2024 release? Well... It does appear to be that Nintendo's getting ready to release new hardware this year. Yeah. As for the way Nintendo works, they usually don't announce games more than a few months in advance. The only game we know of that they've announced a while back and hasn't come out yet is Metro Prime 4. Mm -hmm. And games I'm sure that's the kind out. of game that if they ever release that game, that's the kind of game that will come out to launch a new system. Like, ah, it must I'm like... In. Breath of the Wild or Twilight Princess, where it'll come out for Nintendo Switch. But if you buy the new system as well, you'll be able to play it there. Maybe with better graphics. Maybe with the new main feature of the new system will be implemented in Metro Prime 4 as well. So you can have Metro Prime 4. And usually when Nintendo announces the new system, they announce a dozen of new games for it as well because usually by the end of the console generation, Nintendo gets their developers to work on a bunch of new games for their new system. And they all come out pretty soon after launch. There it is. You heard it here first. Willie knows. Willie does know. Willie, who are you kissing at Nintendo to get this information? Kissing? That was a joke. Says, <laughs> that was, that was a you think I have to do that? <laughs> oh shit! Willie just walks in the door with his cape and just goes. He's a wordsmith. Tell me everything. <laughs> nice. How about Paul? What are you looking forward to in 2024? Uh, there's a lot for me. Um, so uh, print new Prince of Persia and the new like Dragon games um are probably immediately on the horizon. Um. Like Willie, uh, I would also love to see uh, Metroid Prime 4 um, if it actually does <laughs> come out. Uh, I'm also looking forward to uh, Dragon Dogma 2. Um, and oh. the, you know, uh, I'm looking forward to that and, and maybe even a little more uh, the fact that Capcom can now start to work on Devil May Cry 6 after that. Oh, um, finally. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the Elden Ring DLC um, supposed to be next year, I believe. Next uh, we'll year? See if that actually happens this year. Sorry. Oh, I was about I keep, to say. I keep Jesus. forgetting that that it's it's not 2024. I was about to say, um, God, another year, <laughs> and we're sitting yeah. here going like, man, we hate it when game companies are like, yeah, shit's coming out yeah. in like seven years. <laughs> um, and then uh, this one is much more up in the air, but I am still holding out. Uh, hope for it because the the initial trailer looked interesting for me. Um, Star Wars Outlaws. Uh, okay. I don't usually play too much in the way of Star Wars games, and I don't play much in the way of Ubisoft games. Um, so having both of those in one thing is very unusual for me. Um, but uh, you know, Ubisoft at least appears to have nailed the Prince of Persia game. Um, and everything they showed off at, what is it? It's, it's not E3 anymore. Um, Summer Games Fest, uh, looked promising. So I'm very curious to see where it goes. It's even got like a Fallout style karma system and factions, um, mm. and, uh, ship travel in real time, space travel in real time. Uh, so I am very curious to see what they end up doing with it. The true Starfield. 
time. You said it, not me. <laughs> I did, I did, I did. Guys, send death threats my way at john at yahoo.com. Um, <laughs> uh, wait, did you play, um, real quick, Paul, did you play um, Jedi Fallen Order? I did not. Um, I have been meaning to get around to those games, uh, but they kind of fell by the wayside along with everything else on my backlog. <laughs> Under- really good. Uh, understandable. I'm- I'm I'm just now getting around to the Aliens game from last year. Oh, uh, Dark Descent. Yeah, that's pretty all right. Like it's good. Like I feel like Alien had like a good two year run for games. Yeah, I'm I'm surprised by how much I've uh, actually enjoyed it. Um, it's it's kind of like XCOM but real time. Yeah, at least XCOM XCOM base management with real time gameplay. It's it's solid. I played a good six hours of it before I just fell off for other shit. But uh, yeah. like like life and shit like that. But it's a it's a fun game. I I should get back to it. Um, How about you, John? What are your games? Um, real quick, I'm going to tell Paul to play um, Fallen Order because those are like Dark Souls level Star Wars games. You have your powers. You have your lightsaber. Um, combat. No. Oh, can I can I throw one thing out there? And and sure. this is a a really stupid thing. Um, but I I as as Dumb as this is, I think one thing that, that sort of held me back from, like, really getting, like, immediately jumping into those games is how, like, it's Dark Souls combat, but with a lightsaber, mm. right? Like, every time I see a lightsaber, I'm like, this is something that should be slicing everything in half instantly. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's said it's just bonking off, you know, enemies and, you know, barely. T- and, like, I get why that has to happen for gameplay sake, but it's like, man... Isn't, does it feel like I'm a Jedi? <laughs> it's like a modern problem with Star Wars, and this is, and I'm going to end my tangent right now, but it's like when I watched the Obi-Wan series last year yeah. or two years ago, and it's just like, it's like when Darth Vader first touched Obi-Wan with that lightsaber in the first movie, he just fucking disappears. <laughs> like he, he just yeah, like but he absorbed into the force. That was a much more important scene than just. I, I I I know, but now they like they get slices and they're like, oh, burn the lightsaber. Yeah, right. right yeah, it's right. like, and I I get what Paul's saying, but um. Yeah, no, I I, I do too. I I do think that um the Dark Souls esque um approach to gameplay though does work, and I know they use like and and the movies use them too where. Uh, some of those like shock troopers that have like the uh, electric pole type weapons yeah. that, they, right, that that are magically able to to stop the lightsaber's momentum, right? So I don't know. I guess you could say that they 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 do kind of address it in some ways, but like just hacking away at somebody, you feel like you should be cutting them to tiny little pieces. Yeah. yeah. Um, um. So John, what are your games? As as far what as what I am excited for, I am very excited for Final Fantasy Rebirth. Um, I think that the, I, I'm very excited to see what they do with the story, given that they flipped, um, the remake on its head is this kind of like parallel universe style of game. Um, Persona 3 Reload, um, Persona 3 is a fantastic game and I'd love to see it in, uh, like the way I imagined I played it for the first time. Um, but I think one of my more anticipated games, uh, as we spoke about Microsoft today a lot, um, is uh, Chernobyl two? I love those. Okay. I, I love those. I love those Chernobyl games. Uh, I never played Call of Pripyat, but um, Shadow of Chernobyl is like one of my favorite games. It's fantastic. Wow. It's like it's it's that. like Russian Fallout. It's great. There's like a little bit of a karma system. Maybe not too many skills, but it like meshes this kind of like wacky wasteland with really good horror elements at times um with really good enemies and really good gameplay and j- i just can't wait to see it can't wait to see it because yeah. it's just it's it's something different it like it itches that kind of no man's sky uh nerve in me or like string in me where it's like this is exploration where i don't have to have any guidance yeah. Um yeah. if I do have the guidance, it's great, but right. I don't have to push the story along. You can be left to your own devices. Just and then it's just yeah, yeah, and and you can play the game for like uh probably like 50 to 100 hours yeah. and be like, "Oh, I'm just doing this like fighting anomalies and right. collecting artifacts from the Chernobyl reactor to survive." Yeah. 
though, and fighting mutants. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I know my, my coworkers who I have a couple coworkers that just started No Man's Sky and they're like, what's the game like? And I'm like, I don't really know how to answer that. It's like whatever I want it to be when I decide to play it that, that day. It's... Sometimes I'm a I'm a smuggler and I just go from pirate system to pirate system. Sometimes I'm just building my house up. Sometimes you know what I mean? Like some so days animals. I'm just a naked guy on a planet. That's it. Sometimes I'm just a naked guy on a planet shooting animals. That's right. <laughs> oh my god. Um, <laughs> oh my god. Sometimes. Sometimes. Um, uh, for me, I am uh, really looking forward to Dragon's Dogma 2. Um, I think for uh, most people, they probably, who have not seen Dragon's Dogma, or have not played Dragon's Dogma 2, I think that it's one of those games that just pops up, uh, Dr- Dragon's Dogma pops up in like the bargain bin on every e-store for like four ninety nine. Yeah. It has for like the past 10 years, and people just glaze over i've heard i've heard but but is it really that good and i i just think you know dragons dragons dogma was one of those rpgs that like caught me off guard like so many other people because it just feels so goddamn fresh dragon's dogma sorry no i I mean it, it just is it's just one of those games that i when i'm playing that game i feel like I'm playing something I've never played before in this way. Uh, it is a sum of its parts. There are definitely aspects of the games that we've played before in other types of games. Uh, but that game hits in a way that few other action RPGs hit. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the second game. Um, Dragon's and then I have Dogma. one more, but oh, what did you want to say about it? I wanted to say Dragon's Dogma is simultaneously the most exciting and boring game I've played at the same time. Yeah, 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 like, I know what you mean. It's like, you're go- like, especially with Dark Arisen when they finally added fucking fast travel, um, yeah. it's like you're going around from quest to quest, or you're doing these hunts, or you're doing all this cool shit, and it's really, really good. But like the in-between parts when you're getting there, you're just like, I, I want to get there now. Why is this world yeah. so fucking big and it's it's almost like forespoken a little bit by the way fuck that game um <laughs> oh, wow that's a change from one podcast to the next <laughs> it, fuck that game um but it's like it, it almost doesn't utilize the world in the best way possible but it utilizes yeah, it but, but the combat is so good that you can't help from going from one encounter to the next if they tighten up things like that john and i i 100 percent agree with you um that that it, it, there's some redundancy there's some da- too much downtime in the traversal things of that nature but if they tighten elements up and they stick to what makes the game great which to your point is the the gameplay loop and the pawn system and the uh you know just the the interesting crazy enemies scattered around the world like they're gonna have a hit on their hand because i think people now generally appreciate what that game brought in whenever it came out what was it like 2010 or something like that when it came out uh but anyways uh my other game that i'm really excited to play is helldivers 2 oh Um, you're gonna fucking rope me back into that one yeah i was a i was a day one i saw it it started for me back when when magicka came out um we would we played a lot of magicka on steam and Loved the friendly fire, loved the different style of gameplay and the stratagem gameplay where you had to like mix together spells. Um, so uh, Helldivers 1 was on my my watch list well before it came out and it totally delivered. Still has a great community of players. It's still one of the like the most white knuckled games you can play right now is Helldivers on any type of hard difficulty. That game just kicks your ass. Um, but Helldivers 2, my initial reaction was disappointment that they went to third person, because do we really need another third person game with a gun in it? Um, but, the answer is yes. But apparently yes. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let that dissuade me. I'm going to let the game try to speak for itself. And if they captured the gameplay in a more compelling way from that perspective and they tightened up some things... Uh, I think Helldivers 2 is going to have just as much, if not a better future, than the first game did. God, it just makes me think of all those times when you, me, and Heil would play, and we'd scream, who has the fucking briefcase? Yes. Or we, or one of us would spawn in, like, the rover, and the other two would be on the guns, and we'd just be aimlessly driving around the map trying not to die. Oh, my God. I lo- Helldi- have, you guys, have you ever played that, Willie? Have you ever played Helldivers? No, I have not. It's crossplay. Oh. It's crossplay on PC, too. Yeah. 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 But that's it for me. 
What's that? No, I said I was asking Paul if he ever played Helldivers. Oh, you ever played it? You ever played? Oh it, no, I have not. Sorry. Oh, no? oh, Helldivers is like simultaneous. Again, it's one of those games where it's almost like it's almost like Payday, where everyone yes. has to kind of play a role. Like it somebody has, has to, be, to work together. Somebody has to be a medic. Somebody has to be a support, and then you need like two gunners. And somebody's not playing the role, and somebody's like the medic's like, I got the fucking briefcase, and I'm carrying it, but I can't heal you because I got the briefcase. And you're just, you're all screen. It's like when we first played Pay 83, Paul, where the first thing you fucking did was throw a grenade. <laughs> all right. So that that is because the controls suck. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, that, yeah, that's true. Helldivers is definitely like that. It's also the yeah. friendly fire piece and, you know, just the unabashed, like, you know difficulty and i it's just a it's a really it's one of those games that when everybody gets wiped out everybody's laughing as opposed to like oh we just lost so much time it's like oh that was a hell of a lot of fun and we almost made it we almost extracted you know what i mean so, you have you have fun doing it you have, yeah you have fun yeah. losing in that game yeah you do so jeff why don't you uh why don't you take us out yeah well uh thank you everybody for sticking around i think we probably made this around an hour and a half long podcast tonight. So hour and 26 um, minutes and 20 seconds. Wow. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, we want to uh, say thanks to everybody listening. This is the first of what we hope is going to be a regular uh, gathering of about time perspectives and opinions. And uh, we'll dick try to jokes. get these out to you and, and dick jokes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, you know, on behalf of John and Paul and Heil and Willie, uh, I'm Jeff, and yeah, we enjoy talking with you guys, and we hope that uh, you'll stick around for more. See you soon. Yeah, bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.